All right, so here we're going to wrap up enzymes and we're going to venture into enzyme regulation. Now, um, one target for, I guess, altering an enzyme's activity is to develop something that's a transition state analog. Now, serine proteases are examples of enzymes that preferentially bind to the transition state. So, you know how we, uh, there's this, there's a state of any sort of molecule that goes from its initial state to its final state. So the, the reactants in the product. Now, in an energy diagram that looks a little bit like this, and this region right here is your, your transition state. And so one of the ways in which an enzyme is going to um, speed up the process is by making a molecule that kind of matches that transition state or basically has the organization of its amino acids to reflect or to only complement the transition state. So serine proteases, they have um, uh, active sites that strongly resemble the transition state for a peptide being broken. Now, the tighter an enzyme binds to the transition state, the greater the rate of the catalyzed reaction relative to the uncatalyzed reaction. Stable molecules that geometrically and electronically resemble the transition state are known as transition state analogs and are potent inhibitors of enzymes. So essentially, if you have something that fits into the transition state better than the natural substrate, well, you're going to be able to uh, inhibit or prevent that reaction from taking place. So that is the way that there are a number of different nerve toxins, or that's the way that a number of different nerve toxins work. Uh, acetylcholine esterase is a serine esterase. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. Now, nerves are repolarized, so the, the presence of cations and anions, the balance of cations and anions inside versus outside of the cell are going to be uh, flipped on this. Uh, nerves are repolarized upon the hydrolysis of that acetylcholine. Now, uh, aspartic proteases are another class of enzymes that have two active site aspartic acid residues. These enzymes are active at acidic pHs, which you can pretty reasonably say that they would be considerably less active at um, very basic pHs. So if you look at these two amino acids, we've got We've got a protonated aspart or protonated aspartate and a deprotonated aspartate. We utilize water. We establish hydrogen bonds between those residues and that water, as well as that substrate. Aspartic proteases are important in digestion and regulation of blood pressure. HIV-1 protease is a protease that is responsible for uh, sustained infection of HIV. It's an aspartic protease. It cleaves the polyprotein products of the HIV-1 genome, producing proteins necessary for viral growth and cellular infection. Um, so basically, a virus or HIV-1 exists as an mRNA. It gets translated into a protein. And this protease is responsible for breaking this uh, polyprotein down into substituent proteins that can then go on to facilitate the infection. Now, protease inhibitors are great examples of drugs to develop. Um, all of the new drugs on the market to treat HIV and AIDS are protease inhibitors, and they are all specific inhibitors of HIV-1 protease. I guess the idea there is if you can block that protease that's responsible for the subsequent infection, well, then that's a very great target to go after to ultimately undermine the ability of the virus to replicate and, and infect. Uh, these drugs were developed through structure-based design strategies. So what that means is they establish the uh, structure of the protein and said, okay, well, here's the active site. We're going to design a molecule that matches or that lands right there. Um, and 
you know, this just goes to, all right, I really want this to be something that you look at and say, oh, okay, so a structure, a 3D structure, the tertiary structure of protein is very valuable because if you know what a protein looks like and you can lock it in that position or manipulate that structure in some form or fashion, then maybe you can control whether or not a, uh, a virus replicates. So here are just some examples of protease inhibitors. Uh, another protease is carboxypeptidase. And this is just, I wanted to show just another illustration of basically how we cleave off a C-terminal amino acid. So carboxypeptidase, what that's going to do is it's going to cleave off a, a C-terminal amino acid. And here what we have is an example of that, this tyrosine residue is getting cleaved off. Um, the peptide bond that's being broken is right here. And ultimately the aim of this is to use tyrosine, glutamic acid, a zinc ion, and arginine to either establish an ionic interact, or sorry, all these amino acids are doing a number of different things. They're establishing ionic interactions. They're involving hydrogen bonds. Um, what I want you to take away from this model is I want you to look at this and think about what these different amino acids are doing. Then I want you to also look at this right here, that zinc two plus. It's not shown but I'd like you to think about, well, what amino acids are stabilizing that zinc ion, holding that zinc ion in place? Uh, because if you think about a zinc ion being attracted to something electronegative like an oxygen, well, are there other oxygens freely floating around in the environment? Absolutely. But that zinc ion seems to be level, steady in one spot. Well, those X's that I've indicated, we've actually looked at previously uh, enzymes that are involved in, uh, or metal, metalloenzymes. And I would speculate that a histidine or histidines are responsible for holding that zinc ion in place. Okay, so with that in mind, we've talked about proteases, but now let's talk about some of the enzymes that are involved in DNA and RNA. One class of enzymes are known as polymerases, DNA and RNA polymerases. These synthesize nucleic acids in a five prime to three prime direction. These DNA polymerases require an existing three prime OH. So if there is not a three prime at low H, the DNA polymerase will not function. RNA polymerases do not require a primer because they can add the first base. These polymerases can also have another type of activity known as exonuclease activity. What that means is that although they synthesize in a five prime to three prime direction, they also have the ability to work backwards and work in the three prime to five prime direction. One reason for this is commonly known as proofreading. What that means is that if they add the wrong uh, nucleotide, what they can do is they can go backwards and say, oh, got to get rid of that. That wasn't supposed to be an adenine or an adenosine monophosphate, that should be a uh, guanine monophosphate. In the prokaryotic system, there are several DNA polymerases, but only one RNA polymerase. In the eukaryotic system, there are several of both RNA and DNA polymerases. Ligases are another class of RNA and DNA enzymes, and they connect or ligate DNA breaks. So these kind of do the opposite of your 
DNA endonucleases slash restriction enzymes. So our DNA polymerase mechanism is shown here. And what a DNA polymerase is going to do is it's going to bring in something like a ATP. And what it is going to do is it's going to identify and match up whatever the template strand of DNA has. So this is our template strand right here. And the DNA polymerase is going to say, aha, you need to add a I'm just going to say an A, and so what it's going to bring in is ATP. Well, our ATP molecule is shown right here. I'm going to erase that because that was not drawn well at all. It's a nucleotide, so it has at least one phosphate. In this case, it has three phosphates, a nitrogenous base, a sugar, so one phosphate, two phosphate, three phosphate. We're going to use magnesium ions to hold these phosphates in place. We're going to use a negative charge in the on the three prime position on the base upstream to basically remove two of our phosphate groups from our ATP, which is where this PPI comes from. So this is the sort of thing that we are utilizing an enzyme, or we are utilizing a metal ion to catalyze this reaction. It's important to basically know the players that are involved, the amino acids that are involved. We have two aspartate residues. Interestingly though, one of these aspartates, if you look closely, well, this is actually the, the backbone that is helping to stabilize that magnesium. No, I'm sorry, there's, sorry, I missed this third aspartate residue. So we've got aspartate residues that are involved there. And the result is shown here, where we have a three prime, two five prime phosphodiester linkage. DNA polymerase requires all four deoxyribonucleotides, ribonucleoside triphosphates or ribonucleotides, DTTP, DATP, DGTP, DCTP. This is a DNA polymerase, so it would not use DUTP. Requires magnesium and it requires a RNA primer. The RNAs mechanism on the other hand, what makes it different and what makes it similar? Well, the amino acids that are involved in the RNA polymerase versus the DNA polymerase, it's again, some aspartate residues, okay? What else makes it, or what makes it different? Because they also have magnesium ions. So the amino acids and the magnesium ions are identical. What makes it different is this two prime position. The two prime position on your substrate. Well, RNA polymerase requires all four ribonucleoside triphosphates or ribonucleotides. UTP, ATP, GTP, CTP. So I need to go back and correct this. Use the incorrect notation. Deoxyadenosine triphosphate. This requires magnesium. No RNA primer is required. And there we can proceed. Okay. Now, those RNA that for the DNA polymerase, that RNA primer that was used, basically that's a part of the that the enzyme uses to establish a double strand and add from there. So the RNA primer is removed from Okazaki fragment uh, from o upon completion of the synthesis. So DNA polymerase, what it's going to do is it is going to synthesize a new piece of DNA, 
and then it's going to have this right here, which is your RNA primer. So it synthesized this whole chunk right here. So the DNA polymerase had an RNA primer that caught on where there was a single stranded piece of DNA and aligned with that. It said, okay, good. Now I can add to that. Now DNA polymerase, what it is going to do is it is going to recognize that open spot and it is going to remove it. The RNA polymerase is replaced with DNA by DNA polymerase one. And that nick, or heck, this kind of applies for any open spot like this, any double-stranded break like that, is going to be sealed or kind of repaired by a DNA ligase. Now, DNA ligase joins the ends of DNA molecules. So what it is going to do, actually, you know what? What I want you to know about DNA ligase is that it's going to address a nick and a double-stranded piece of DNA. And that's effectively it. That's what I want you to know about it. The DNA ligase mechanism, you can move through that. Now we're going to get to regulation. Regulation of enzymes. This is, we're just kind of touching the tip of the iceberg, which is kind of the, the important or kind of what we do in a survey type of class. Okay, so enzymes can be regulated in a couple of different ways, or enzymes activities can be regulated in a couple of different ways. Isozymes are enzymes that have similar but not identical amino acid sequences. Each will catalyze the same biochemical reaction. They differ in their kinetics. They have different KMs and they have different Vmaxes. What I want you to know right now about KM and Vmax is that these are known as kinetic parameters. Basically what they do is they measure how fast an enzyme catalyzes a reaction, which is your Vmax, how fast. And KM is a measure of affinity. An enzyme has or its substrate. Different isozymes will use different effectors and forms of coenzymes. The cellular distribution of each will vary as well. And a classic example goes back to the sugar breakdown pathway known as glycolysis and the enzymes that are involved in the first step of glycolysis. Those enzymes are hexokinase and glucokinase. Hexokinase is found in the muscle exclusively. Glucokinase is found in the liver. Now these two enzymes vary quite a bit. Hexokinase, just as the name says, well, it will actually bind to any hexose. So you can kind of think about that as it has equal affinities for any and every hexose, whether it is, uh, yeah, so any or any and every hexose, this hexokinase will bind to. Glucokinase, on the other hand, has very low affinity for every single hexose except for glucose. So both of these will act on glucose, but only one of them will act on mannose, for instance, because mannose is another hexose. Glucokinase will say, uh -uh, stay away from me, mannose, whereas hexokinase will say, fine, I'll bind. So it's important to know those differences. And those, are, those enzymes effectively do the exact same thing, but they have different distributions. They have different uh, properties and a reason for that is basically the regulation that those two different enzymes have in your blood sugar. Okay, allosteric enzymes. We've already talked about allosteric. Specifically, we talked about allosteric when we talked about um, uh, hemoglobin. Well, just as hemoglobin 
is an, a protein that has a T and an R state. There are enzymes that have T and R states. So your T state is going to be your inactive form and your R state is going to be your active form. These are enzymes that typically are going to act as regulatory enzymes in a pathway. And what they're going to do is kind of dictate whether or not this process proceeds. So on the right-hand side, we have a general pathway that shows the amino acid L-threonine being metabolized into L-isoleucine. There's multiple enzymes in this pathway, but one of them, threonine dehydratase, is actually inhibited by L-isoleucine. So this is kind of a negative feedback loop. It's, it's a way to regulate the amount of L-isoleucine that's produced. Now, on the left-hand side, so that's kind of your global idea, and, or global as well as a specific example. On the left-hand side, we have a molecule that at the top is shown more or less as a, uh, more or less as a rectangular type of shape. And then at the bottom, we have something that resembles a little bit of a, a, a rectangle at a slant or at an angle. Now, within these two, within this rectangle, we've got one shape that has a C and one that is an R. So this C is shown to indicate your catalytic domain. That's the domain that actually causes and does the reaction. Your R, on the other hand, is your regulatory domain. So, Essentially, that regulatory domain is going to say whether or not C can do its job. Now, this at the top would basically be your T state, your less active enzyme, and at the bottom, we've got our R state, our more active version of the enzyme. Now, when we have that less active form moving to the more active form and ultimately to the most active form, what we're going to see is the binding of a molecule that causes this transition. We have M indicated as a positive modulator. That positive modulator, what it is going to do is it's going to induce this T state to begin moving towards the R state. And we're going to see that this binding site right here in the T state in the right of the regulatory domain for our positive modulator, the shape doesn't match up perfectly, but what we notice is that Transitioning from the T state to this mid ground, well, the shape of our regulatory domain manipulates itself or it changes enough to bind that positive modulator. So as soon as that positive modulator has been bound, we have our regulatory uh, domain that's basically satisfied. And as that regulatory domain has shifted and changed its shape, so too has the entire enzyme that catalytic domain can now bind our free substrate. And when it binds that free substrate, we are now in the form of R. We've got our fully active enzyme substrate complex. So what you might see, and these are, are good curves to show the kinetic parameters that I, I alluded to previously. Um, and you know what, I'm actually not going to go into these because we're going to go into them a little bit further um, for our next exam. But this is well, actually, yeah, I'll ask you very general questions on the exam. Um, on your y-axis, you have your initial velocity. On your x-axis, you have your substrate concentration. And we have a maximum velocity that our enzyme can catalyze a reaction. And we have something known as a Km that corresponds to, well, one half Vmax. So what is the amount of substrate that gets you to half of your maximum velocity? I would say that this is very similar to, and it's important to think about it as very similar to your P50. Okay, so moving on to our next level of uh, our discussion of regulation. We have covalent modification. So every enzyme is made up of amino acids. Amino acids, I mean, heck, if you talk about cysteine, cysteine undergoes a covalent modification. 
with other cysteines to form a disulfide bond. So that's not too crazy of an idea. Now, with that in mind, there are other amino acids that can undergo covalent modification. For, our, for your consideration, covalent modification consists of the reversible covalent changes to specific amino acid side chains. So these are side chains that are within a polypeptide, within a protein. Enzymes are used to convert the regulatory enzyme to either an active or an inactive form. So here are two examples of covalent modifications. We have the amino acid tyrosine. Now tyrosine is quite commonly uh, oh, 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 oh. adenylated. Uh, there you go, there's your spoiler, you got two slides left. Tyrosine can be adenylated. And what that means is it will see ATP, it will hydrolyze that uh, phosphodiester bond between the alpha and the beta phosphate group and release PPI, or this molecule is known as inorganic pyrophosphate. What that means is that the remainder, basically the AM of, or the AMP, basically jumps onto where there was a tyrosine residue. And so what we have is an adenylated enzyme. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can look at this. One way that you could look at it is you could say, well, this has, this is an enzyme that has like a, a nodule almost on it. It's got this modification. It's got this extra group on it. But then I think that it's also important to think about this from a chemical standpoint. We had a tyrosine. If we look at the R group for a tyrosine, it looks a little bit like this. It can participate in hydrogen bonding, sure. It's a somewhat polar group because it's got that OH group. Well, this whole thing, including the nitrogenous base adenine, gets added to that OH. So rather than it being an OH, instead it's this big group, which I'll begin to draw but I will very quickly stop because it takes up a ton of space. And then we've got our base. And I'm not even going to draw the nitrogenous base because that takes up even more space. So we're taking a single hydrogen and replacing it with all of the atoms that make up that group right there. That's going to fundamentally change how that molecule or how that protein basically exists and interacts with itself, as well as interacts with other adjacent proteins. So this is an example of modifications that can lead to an enzyme being activated. Now, the interactions are going to change. The localization of a, a protein is going to change. Maybe it was a protein that was found in the nucleus whenever it gets adenylated. Then it goes to the mitochondria. It varies tremendously, but what I want you to know is that tyrosine is the amino acid that can't be adenylated. Now, another, co another covalent modification is known as methylation. This is what can happen to a glutamic acid residue. So a glutamic acid, that residue can, with the help of a molecule known as SAM or S-adenosylmethionine, be converted to S-adenosyl homocysteine. What this can also do is add a methyl group, CH3, onto a glutamic acid. So glutamate is a target for methylation. Our next and last covalent modification is known as phosphorylation. Now, we've now covered adenylation, methylation, phosphorylation. There are hundreds of different post-translational modifications. These are just three examples. But these amino acids that are targeted are also just a couple of them. Tons of other amino acids can undergo tons of other different 
modifications. Phosphorylation, well, that is the addition of a phosphate group onto an amino acid. The amino acids that are most likely going to be targeted or most commonly targeted would be the amino acid serine. So serine has a group, an R group that looks like this. So basically you're replacing that OH with OPO3 2 minus. You're taking a group that was polar uncharged and making it polar negatively charged. But your amino acids that are most likely targeted, tyrosine, serine, threonine, histidine. Now, an example of what that looks like. Here, what we have is an enzyme known as phosphorylase B. Phosphorylase B is a dimeric protein. So that means it's made up of two uh, monomers. Each one of these monomers, they're identical, it's a homodimer, has a serine at position number 14 in the polypeptide. The enzyme phosphorylase kinase will take the enzyme phosphorylase B as well as two ATP molecules, and it will phosphorylate serine 14 on each one of those structures, on each one of those monomers. Whenever it adds a phosphate group to each one of those positions, we have a doubly phosphorylated phosphorylase A. This is the active version of our enzyme. Okay, so covalent modification also includes the removal of those groups. So those phosphates can be removed from phosphorylase A, reverting us back to our less active phosphorylase B. The enzyme phosphorylase phosphatase is responsible for removing those phosphate groups. So I, I do want you to be familiar with this terminology, phosphorylase kinase and phosphorylase phosphatase. Those are both involved in the removal or addition of a phosphate group. So just a little, uh, as a little bit of a recap, tyrosine is an amino acid that can be the target for adenylation as well as phosphorylation. Now, this is just the, the tip of the iceberg for regulation of enzymes. Um, modification is one way, but then of course, if you think back to the central dogma of molecular biology, you've got DNA going to RNA going to proteins. You can have regulation at the RNA going to protein. You can also have regulation at DNA going to the RNA. So this is just the beginning of it. And this area of research is very, very interesting because an enzyme or a process might be regulated multiple different ways. It wants, you want it to be tightly regulated so nothing goes haywire. All right, well, I hope this was helpful. And this wraps up the material for the... Uh, the next exam. All right, well, have a good one.